How we feel plays such a major part in our future. First, it's what we know, so we can make wise decisions about danger and opportunity. But second is how we feel. But second is how we feel. By sexy, first, it's how you feel about the past. You need a healthy attitude about the past so that you use it, not live in it, but use it. Not carry it like a burden, but let the wise lessons you learn from the past now serve as fuel to furnish the future. Next, a good attitude about the future. You gotta set your goals. We look back for experience, but we look forward for inspiration. We must be instructed and inspired. No better inspiration than the successful village. I started this process when I was 25, literally rocked my world, changed my life. I had no idea it was so simple. Here's how simple it is. Decide what you want, write it all down. Make a list of the people you want to meet. Make a list of the books you want to read. Make a list of the classes you want to take. Make a list of the skills you want to learn. Make a list of the cities you want to visit. Make a list of the investments you want to have foreign. Just make these lists. Here's the next. Start checking them off. Put a lot of little things on some lists so you can start checking off something right away. That's part of the fun. Here's what's next. If you check off something major, Celebrate, because that inspires you to make a longer list of both and put everything on your list. Little things insignificant to someone else, important to you. I put a little revenge on my first list. My mentor said it's healthy. Some of the people who said I couldn't succeed, kids from the farms of Idaho, they went on my list. Couldn't wait to get my new car, drive it up on their lawn, say, oh, pardon me, here's the money to have it fixed. This little satisfaction. My Japanese friend Toro Ikeda, San Jose, California, put me on his first list. California put me on his first list. Caucasian gardener. Okay, back then everybody had a Japanese gardener. Everybody Japanese garden. I said, I'm Japanese. I'm going to have a Caucasian garden. Okay, a little satisfaction, right? Set your goals. Decide what you want. Write it down. Start checking them off. It's powerful stuff. Next, it's how you feel about everybody. If you want to be a leader, true leader, Entrepreneur of the highest order, well-respected, unique in your field. Here's number one, how you feel about everybody. And this is philosophical as well. You cannot succeed by yourself, so a unique sense of appreciation of everybody goes with the territory of leadership. It takes everybody for each of us to be successful. One person doesn't make an economy. One person doesn't make a symphony orchestra. It takes everybody for this gathering today. All of you had to be here to make this together. Everybody. If one of you were missing, there wouldn't be this many people here. Everybody to make something work for the office, whatever the enterprise takes, everybody. The gift of America is everybody who came over the last two, three hundred years, bring with them their gifts. No country has become such a depository of the gifts of the world like America has over the last two, three hundred years. People coming, bringing their gifts, Gift of language, gift of language, gift of learning, gift of politics, gift of government, gift of medicine, gift of healing, gift of music. Music a gift of the work ethic. All this came in steady streams from all over the world, making us unusual because of the gifts that were brought. And to understand that and appreciate it now gives you open access to the market that's available to make your fortune. Now what I love to do is go back where these gifts came from. Not long ago I was in Rome, had a thousand people in my class. Someone suggested Shimron loves the music of Andrea Bocelli, the blind opera singer from Italy. So when they introduced me, I walked to the podium and all 1,000 of these Italians stood up and sang for me one of Andrea Bocelli's songs in true Italian style. Years I described it to my grandchildren later. I said, here was the scene, a choir of a thousand and an audience of one. And that was me. I thought, here's where some of these gifts sting. The gift of poetry. Gifts. So, learn to appreciate the gifts. Now, the last attitude is how you feel about yourself. Nothing more powerful than self-esteem, which creates self-confidence. The greatest steps towards success come from self-confidence, and that comes from self-esteem. Doing what you know you should so that at the end of the day, you have high, high self-esteem. If you think in a positive way, you'll have positive results and you'll be happy most of the time. So how do you use the power of positive thinking? Well, they did a study at the University of Pennsylvania. It was funded by some of the biggest companies in America. Over a 22-year period, they 
He interviewed more than 350,000 people like you and I and asked them a lot of questions about their lives and their attitudes and so on. One of the questions they asked them is, what do you think about most of the time? And they conducted a series of experiments. They would have graduate students who were working on their papers in psychology or sociology phone these people once a week at random during the week and just say, what are you thinking about right now? Uh, they'd write it down. And the next week, they'd call them on a different day, a different time. This is all prearranged that they would be expecting to call sometime. What are you thinking about right now? Let me write it down. Then they began to sort these groups out in terms of deciles, which is 10. The bottom 10%, the next 10%, all the way up to the top 10%. All the way up to the top 10%. And they noticed that people in the top 10% thought very differently from people in the bottom 80%. What do top people think about most of the time? Can you guess? The answer was so simple, it was amazing. They think about what they want and how to get it most of the time. They think about their goals and they think about their priorities and they think about their actions and activities each day. They think about the number of people they need to call on and the number of proposals they need to put together and the number of things they need to put together and the number of things they need to read and just study. They're always thinking about what they want. And when you think about what you want, it makes you happy. It makes you positive, makes you positive, makes you feel in control of your whole life. And then they think about how to get it. So in my seminars, I'll say that the most important word for leadership and success is the word how. Whenever you have a goal, the only question you ask is, how can I achieve this goal? If I have a problem, how can I solve this problem? If you have an obstacle, how can I overcome the obstacle? Top people think about what they want and how to get it most of the time. And as a result, they're thinking about their goal and they're thinking about the actions that they could take every single minute of every day to move faster toward achieving that goal. Earl Nightingale once said that happiness is the progressive, step-by-step -step realization of a worthy ideal or goal. When you feel yourself moving step-by-step -step each hour, each day, toward achieving something that's important to you, you feel positive and happy most of the time. By the way, do you know what unsuccessful people think about most of the time? They think about what they don't want, the things that make them angry or sad, usually past events that they can't change. And they think about who's to blame for all their problems. So whenever you see people talking and complaining about things that they can't change, things in their life that are their responsibility, and then blaming others for their problems, you know, you're dealing with a negative, unhappy person with a very limited future and a very unhappy present. So the way you take control of your mind, like grabbing the wheel of a vehicle, is to start to think about what you want, how to get it all day long. Your expectations largely determine the quality of your life. In this sense, is that whatever you expect with confidence becomes your self-fulfilling prophecy. In other words, you're always telling your future by the way you talk about how you think things are going to turn out. You're like a fortune teller in your own life. And if you believe that things are going to turn out well, if you expect that you're not well, then by gun they do. If you believe that you're going to be popular, and uh, people are going to buy, and that you have a great product and a great company, and you're going to have a great life, and you're going to have a great life, and you're going to be accepted and well received by people and then you act that way so it's very very important that you always expect the best and this is the key expect the best expect the best expect the best of yourself expect the best of yourself expect the best of other people but especially expect the best of people who look up to you one of the discoveries that Harvard University made is that there are two qualities of child raising that raise happy healthy kids two qualities by the way that raise happy, healthy, powerful business teams as well, and sales teams. Number one is a democratic environment. A democratic environment is where everybody is welcome to express their opinions, and people discuss and debate and get feedback, and so on and so forth. And they make their decisions based on consensus. So everybody feels valuable and important and respected. That's number one. For kids, it's phenomenal. Ever since my kids have been little, I always ask for their opinion. What would you like to do? Where would you like to go? Now as they grow up, we take turns. Where would you like to go for dinner? Where would you like to go? And so on. And the kids decide. And now when they're adults, they feel that their opinion is valid. When they meet with other adults, they feel that their opinion is valid because I've ingrained in them all their lives 
that their opinion is worth something. So, number one is a democratic environment. Number two is a climate of positive expectations. It's the parents' expectation that their kids will do well. Just like I tell my kids, you're going to be a very successful person when you grow up. You're going to do extremely well. You're going to be very popular. You're going to get good grades. When you expect the best of your children, children rise to your expectations. They may argue with you, they may reject, they may discount your positive statements because you're a parent, but it affects them at an unconscious level. I remember reading a wonderful line from a journalist. He said, my father was not very talkative. He was a good man, but he didn't talk very much. But I do remember him saying one thing which affected my whole life. He said, son, I expect you to do something worthwhile with your life when you grow up. I, he said, I still remember that because whenever it came up, he'd say, son, whatever you do, I expect you to do something worthwhile with your life when you grow up. <laughs> he said that rang in my mind all my life. He said, I've driven all my life to do something worthwhile with my life just because of the positive expectations. So it's really important telling people that you expect the best of them. If you're married, telling your spouse that you believe in them and that you expect the best and you believe they'll be successful. And if they're not successful, then they'll learn something. They'll be successful next time. It's repeating that over and over again is the greatest blessing that a person can have. Okay, so expect the best, expect the best, expect the best of other people. Expect the best of yourself too. I want to talk to you today about one of the most important single aspects of success, of all kinds of success, of all kinds of success. And it's what you've heard of called the positive mental attitude. A positive mental attitude is a generally constructive response to the stresses that face the average person every single day. A positive attitude is where you feel that you have the ability to control your world and to control your world and to control your life. A positive attitude is like a chicken and egg thing. If you're successful, you're positive. If you're positive, you're successful. Which comes first? Doesn't really matter. But we know this. Positive thinkers are men and women who accomplish an awful lot more than people who have negative mental attitudes. Your job is to develop a positive mental attitude. Your job is to become thoroughly positive and constructive towards yourself and your possibilities and the world around you and the people in your life. And the way you do this is very much the same way you develop physical fitness. Now, if I were to say to you, if you go to a gym and you work out on a regular basis, an hour, hour and a half a day, and you do this every day for 30 days and you match that with a proper diet, that you'll actually see a difference in yourself physically. Now, if I were to say that to you, you'd say, oh, of course. Anybody knows that if you worked out steadily for 30 days, you'd notice the difference. Well, it's the same thing with mental fitness. So I'm going to ask you to do this for me. I'm going to give you seven steps, seven things that you can do, seven things that have been proven to work. What I'm going to ask you to do is that you practice these seven steps for 21 days. The reason for this is it takes 21 days to develop a new habit pattern of any kind. If you work on a habit pattern and you practice it every day, You'll begin to develop new neural grooves in your brain that cause you to think and act more optimistically automatically. You get up in the morning feeling better. You're more positive toward the challenges you face during the day. You're more optimistic in the face of adversity. You start to become a more confident and optimistic person. And when you do, you'll find your whole life will open up around you like sunshine on a bright morning. There are seven basic steps to mental fitness. If you practice all of these steps together, what will happen to you is incredible. But here's the first rule, and this is the rule that runs through everything. And it is this, remember that everything counts. Everything that you do counts. The biggest mistake that people make is they think that only what they want to count counts. No, when you read a book, when you listen to an audio program, when you go to a course, when you go to bed early and get up early and you work, it all counts and it's all going on the plus side of your ledger. But when you watch television, waste time, hang out, fool around and so on, all of that counts as well and it's going on the negative side of your ledger. And here's an important point. If what you are doing is not moving you towards your goals, then it's probably moving you away from your goals. Nothing is neutral. Everything that you're doing is either moving you toward the things that you want to accomplish in life, the person you want to be, the wealth you want to accumulate, or it's moving you away. 
Everything counts. Number one is positive self-talk. Positive self-talk means that you are optimistic in your conversation with yourself. What we have found is that 95 of your emotions, how you feel about yourself on a minute-to-minute -minute basis, are determined by the way you talk to yourself. This is called your inner dialogue. It's the stream of words and thoughts and feelings that course through your day like a river going through your mind. The sad fact is that if you do not deliberately and consciously talk to yourself in a positive and constructive way, you will, by default, think about things that will make you unhappier because you worry and anxiety. Remember your mind is like a vacuum. It will not remain empty. If you don't fill it with positive thoughts, it will fill with negative thoughts. And you know exactly what I'm talking about. Your mind is like a garden. If you do not deliberately plant flowers and tend them carefully, weeds will grow without any encouragement at all. If you don't take positive thoughts and take good care of them, negative thoughts will grow in your mental garden without any effort on your part. Your entire world around you is a mirror that reflects back to you your dominant thoughts. You say, wherever you look, there you are. It's almost like you live in a 360 degree mirror. And wherever you look, you see yourself reflected back. Now, the three or four places where this is most common is, first of all, your relationships. Now remember, human beings are extraordinarily sensitive so that if you have negative thoughts going on about anything, you affect the relationships close to instantaneously. They'll pick it up across the crowded room. Women, by the way, are far better at this than men. Men are kind of like blocks of cheese. But women are like high-tech computers. Have you ever had an experience every man's had? They phone home, they say hi, she says what's wrong? That's all you said is I. Hello? She said what's wrong? Is it your boss again? How did you know? A woman can pick it up with a single word. You can walk in the door and say hi, and she'll just go. Maybe it's at me. She'll just read with regard to relationships almost instantaneously. We'll show you what's going on inside your own thoughts. If you're feeling happy, your relationships will reflect it immediately. If you're unhappy or angry for some reason, they'll reflect on it immediately. A second area, by the way, has to do with income. Your outer world of income will be determined by your inner world of attitude toward money, earning productivity, performance, and everything else. With regard to your health, your inner world of attitude toward health, food, diet, fitness, Everything else determines your external world of health and also to success. If you believe that you're going to be a big success, if you believe it on the inside, then you'll see it. It'll be reflected back to you in your outer world. Intelligent people realize that whatever they see in their outer world is coming from themselves. So they always ask this great question. What is it in me? What is it in me that is causing what's going on in my environment? Now this is the mark. The question of the superior person. The average person always tries to blame something in their external environment or someone past, present, future, another mental law. The law of belief. This is a biggie. This is really the biggie. This is the foundation principle, by the way, of all religions and all philosophies and all success. The law of belief. It says that whatever you believe with feeling becomes your reality because you always act on the basis of your beliefs. And the more intensely you hold the belief, the more the belief becomes true for you. There's conscious beliefs that we have, and there's unconscious beliefs. And there's that wonderful line from Josh Billings, the humorist. He said, It ain't what a man knows what hurts them. It's what he knows what ain't true. And many things we know about ourselves ain't true at all. What we do is we develop scotomas or blind spots. Once we've decided to believe certain things, we do not see anything that contradicts it. We may be doing wonderful things or wonderful work or being very successful. We don't even see that if we decide to believe that we will never make much more than we're making. Sometimes your parents will tell you, you know, you've got to be worried about money, you've got to be careful about money all your life, and you'll never make very much. So you've got to hold on to every penny. And so people just hunker down and they're more concerned about security than anything else. And so we develop these beliefs, these blind spots. And sometimes you need somebody to come along and open it up so you can see this vast world of possibilities that you have. And when this happens, people change completely.
So your biggest obstacle is usually self-limiting beliefs. So what are your self-limiting beliefs? What are the most common ones? Well, the most common ones are internally. I'm not smart enough. I'm not as smart as other people. Or I'm not talented enough. Or I'm not creative enough. Is that no one's born with any beliefs? Every belief you have about yourself, your potential, the world, religion, politics, people, anything. Every belief you had, you had to be taught meticulously with very careful instruction repeated over and over again. And so, the starting point of using the law of belief on your behalf is, first of all, you ask yourself, what beliefs would it be useful or helpful to me to have? And imagine that you could go to the belief store and buy a belief like a piece of software and program it into your hard drive so it became part of your operating system. But if you could only choose one belief, what would be a good belief to buy? Well, a friend of mine spent uh, 18 years studying the biographies of more than 500 men and women who had started with nothing and became successful. And he was looking for the common denominator of success, and he found it. He found that every single one of these people throughout their lives absolutely believed that they were going to be a big success. They absolutely believed they were going to be a big success when they grew up. And no matter what happened to them in their adult lives, and they never lost sight of that. Like the three wise men following the star, they felt that everything that happened was part of the process. Every setback was a lesson. Every pain was something sent to teach them something that would be helpful. And they never stopped believing in themselves. So if you could buy one belief, the belief is that you are destined to be a big success, that you have incredible potential, that you're surrounded by incredible opportunities, and that you're going to be a huge success in life, and everything that's happened up to now is part of your preparation. So challenge your self-limiting beliefs. Don't ever say, I, I can't do that, or I'm, I'm not good at that, or something else. No. Wait a sec. What if, what if that's totally false? What if deep down, what if you're deep down inside and you have the ability to be extraordinary? That's something that's important to you, whether skiing or skydiving or mathematics or selling or earning money or running a business. You probably have more ability than you could dream of. But don't sell yourself short. Now in the Bible it says, according to your faith, that is done unto you. That's one of the most important principles of the New Testament. The Old Testament, it says, as a man thinketh in his heart, and the heart stands for the subconscious mind, which means a deep belief. So is he or so is she. William James says beliefs create the actual fact. Is it easy to change your beliefs, especially old, negative ones? No, it's not easy. Is it possible? Absolutely. Is it easy to lose weight? No. Is it possible? Of course it is. Everyone here is either a self-made millionaire or you intend to be in the future. Everybody loves the subject of becoming wealthy. And then I'm going to give you seven keys to becoming an outstanding leader in this industry and to becoming one of the highest paid people in our society and becoming wealthy. The wonderful thing is, they're not complicated. In order to become a millionaire, yeah, you have to become a completely different person. You have to develop character beyond 99% of the people in the world. You have to develop honesty, discipline, quality relationships, and the willingness and the ability to work, set priorities, and all kinds of stuff. Because without that, nothing is possible. The first one of all is dream big dreams. I couldn't believe it. Every single person who finally made it, at the turning point in their life. They were driving down the road of life, not making much progress, which is that 80-20 rule that you hear. 80% of people make a 20% of the money. And what happens at a certain point in life, they change and go on a different road. And here's the turning point. It is make a decision. Make a decision that I'm going to become wealthy. I'm going to become a millionaire. And I will work hard, long hours. I will sacrifice. I will pay the price. I will do everything that is necessary. So I wanted to share with you what I call the seven C's. So the first C is the C of clarity. Clarity is my favorite word in success. It's my favorite word in business. I have done consulting for more than a thousand corporations, large companies, worldwide companies like IBM, 
General Motors, PepsiCo, Bank of America, and many big companies. I've also worked with more than 10,000 small and medium-sized companies. What I found is in every single situation, problems occur when the company becomes unclear about what it is they're doing or how it is they're doing it. So I've developed a program which is really just a fun program for me intellectually. It's called the Two Day MBA and it shows 10 different factors of a company. These are the ones that I learned when I went to university back, university of my 30s, and I find that all problems come from lack of clarity. What is your product? The first question you ask, who is your customer? What does your customer consider to be more valuable than anything else? How are you superior to your competitors? What can you do to attract more customers? How can you close those customers? Number two is write it down, write it down, write it down, write it down. There's nothing more important than writing down your goals, because if it's not written down, it's merely a fantasy. Now they've done a whole series of studies at Harvard, Yale, Cornell and so on, but the difference between students who type their notes and students who write their notes, the students who write their notes all get straight A's. The students who type their notes forget everything before the end of the day, because writing forces you to use three abilities. Your kinesthetic ability, your physical ability of writing, your audio ability, you see it when you're writing it, and your auditory ability, you say it to yourself when you're writing. So you activate the three major parts of your brain simultaneously, like a laser beam from a space station onto a piece of paper, and your subconscious mind accepts it as a command. Your superconscious mind starts to work on it 24 hours a day. Just write it down, write it down. It's the most amazing darn thing. If all you did was write down one goal and leave this conference, your life will be different forever. Because all kinds of things will start to happen, and you'll say, well that's a coincidence. I just wrote that goal down when I was in that meeting this afternoon, and then I got this phone call or something in the mail, or I saw something on TV or something. It's just phenomenal. Step number one, decide what you want. Number two, write it down. Number three, set a deadline. Tell your subconscious when you want it. I want this by such and such a date. So every goal always ends with a use by date. As I achieve this goal by the state, and you write it in the present tense. Step number four is make a list of everything that you can think of to do. Just make a list. And as you think of more things, add it to the list. Keep writing it down, writing it down. Sometimes you think of something in the middle of the night, write it down. Keep a pad of paper next to your bed and quickly write it down so you don't forget it. Just write it down, write it down. That's number four. And this is really important. It's the great turning point like a massive ship turning in the ocean. Your whole life starts to turn when you write down a list of the steps you're going to have to take. I don't recommend other people's books because I've written so many myself, and I summarize hundreds of books that I've read over the years. But there is one book that had a great influence on me, and it's called The Um, The, 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 the Checklist Manifesto. Anybody read this book, The Checklist Manifesto? It was written by a doctor, an emergency ward doctor, and he talks about the value of checklists when you are trying to accomplish a goal build a business, raise a child, whatever you want to do. He says, create a checklist. He said everything in the world, this room, the car, a swimming pool, everything follows a checklist. Everything requires a checklist to build it. And the wonderful thing about organizing a checklist before you begin work on a project has an extraordinary effect on your life. What he does is he teaches in the most entertaining way how people who do not use checklists died, went bankrupt. The most successful people in finance in the world how they use checklists in order to organize their financial life. Business people anyway, it's the one book that I would recommend. It's a short book. It's just fascinating reading. It's called The Checklist Manifesto. Anyway, so take your list of goals and organize your list by priority. Make a checklist. What's number one? What's number two? What's number three? And so on. And as you get more information, change the list, reorganize it, write it, move things up and down. Step number five or set number six is to take action on your list. Take action on the most important thing on your list. Do something. Launch. Get going. Do it now. Do it immediately. Get up and do something. It doesn't have to be a lot. It can be revising your papers, making a phone call, ordering a book or something. But do something, which is sort of like the kickoff at a football game. Just kick the ball off as far as you can. Number seven. And this is going to make you rich, happy, popular, and fit. Number seven is, do something every day on your most important goal. Do something every day on your most important goal. So here's the exercise I'm going to give you to take home with you and do when you leave us. And by the way, from now on, whenever you bring on a new person, put them through this exercise.
If they will not go through this exercise, do not waste a minute of your time with them, because they will never be successful if they won't follow your guidance. Here's the exercise. Take a clean sheet of paper and write down goals and today's date. Then write down 10 goals that you would like to accomplish in the next 12 months. Don't worry about 2 years or 10 years or 5 years, just 10 goals you'd like to accomplish in the next 12 months. Write them in the present tense, almost like you're submitting an order. Just write that I earn, I achieve, I weigh, I drive such and such a car, I own whatever it happens to be, and the goals will be financial goals, family goals, physical goals and so on. Write down 10. Then you take this list of 10, and you say if I had a magic wand, and I could wave this magic wand, and I could have any one goal on my list within 24 hours, which one goal would have the greatest positive impact on my life? Reach one goal, and go over it. Usually this will jump out at you. So jump back out at you like a spider in a horror movie. It'll grab you, and put a circle around that goal. That's a goal you transfer to a clean sheet of paper, and then you follow the seven steps. Write it down, set a deadline, make a list of everything you have to do to accomplish it. Organize the list into a checklist, take action, and then do something every day. If you'll just do this simple exercise then you'll all be rich, I'll be rich. Nothing can stop you but yourself, foreign. So number two, the second C is the C of competence. And the C of competence says it's very simple. You can only earn a lot of money if you're very good at what you do. As one of the most important things you do, is you break down your work into skills, and you say, what are the most important skills I need to have to be successful? Recruiting is a very important skill. Training is an important skill. Managing, motivating is an important skill. Leading, supervising important skills. So what you do is you think, what are the skills that I will need to be in the top 10% of my field? You don't have to be in the top 1%. Just be in the top 10, because there are no successful people who are not good at what they do. They are good at what they do, and they are good at what they do, because they work at it all the time. Whether you're in sports, or whether you're in music, or chess, or anything else, there's a wonderful study that's been written up, and it's called, It'll Come to Me in a Second. I find that when I with, because of these pains, my memory slips, and it goes around in a circle like a merry-go-round, and it comes around again, and it'll come back. And there it is. But basically what it said was studying the most successful people, is that these people spend four more hours becoming good at what they do than average people. The other people don't do it, and that everybody has natural abilities. But the ones who use those abilities transform themselves by really, really working hard at becoming good, one skill at a time. This is another thing that's really important. Don't try to be good. Good at everything. Because what happens is you just break down. You're just overwhelming yourself and you just give up. You say, oh I tried that before. And because all skills are learnable, and you can learn any skill that you want to learn, if you just simply find out what others have done before you and practice it. And then I began to recruit other salespeople and teach them the same thing. I said, here's the product. Here's the advantages and benefits for our customers. And here's how to ask them to make a decision. And they became successful. Many of them today are millionaires and multi-millionaires. Many of them own multiple businesses, and they've told me they said, your training when I was in my 20s, going nowhere broke, changed my life forever. And the most important thing was, I got people just to make a decision. I asked them to make a decision. So many people in this room I know have a challenge with closing. We all do when we start off, but that's where you are now. But that's not where we're going to be three months from now. Three months from now, you're going to be so dangerous, you will need to be restrained for yourself and the safety of society, because you'll be able to close anybody on any. And I'm not talking about pressure. I'm not talking about pressure. Do you know what good business is? Here it's helping. What you are is you are great helpers. You are helping people to improve the quality of their lives and their health and their family. And so when you start to see yourself as a helper, your job is to help people understand how much better off their lives can be if they take your advice and guidance. That's what you do. Earl Nightingale said something many years ago. He said you don't get what you want in life. He said you get what you deserve. And so I began to study that. Deserve, deserve, deserve. And I found that deserve comes from the Latin. And it comes from the words de, which means from service, which from service. So you get what you want in life from service to other people. And so the people who serve the most people the very best, are the ones who make the most amount of money in the shortest period of time. But here's something else. When you help other people improve the quality of your life, your self-esteem goes up, and your self-confidence goes up, and you feel happy, 
and you like yourself more, and you like other people. It's the most amazing darn thing. You just put your life on this wonderful upward spiral by deserving that people will buy from you, by looking for ways to help them. How can I help this person to improve the quality of their life and their family and their work? So see yourself as a helper, and your job is to deserve more. You'll find you look at the Steve Jobs and the Bill Gates and the multi-millionaires or individuals, and you think these people's focused. They had this obsession with a product of some kind that would really help people to improve the quality of their lives, and that's all they think about, and all they talk about. And the only people who succeed in those companies are people who have the same obsession with customer service. Tom Peters, in his book, In Search of Excellence many years ago, said the most important principle of all was the obsession with customer service. The most successful and highest paid people just think of us serving people and helping people improve their lives all the time. So that's the most important level of competence that you want to achieve. First of all, you have clearer goals. And then you say, what is it that I really, really love to do that really helps other people improve the quality of their life? And how can I become really, really good at doing that more and more of the time? The third C is the C of concentration. And these are not necessarily in order. But in a way, these are. The C of concentration is your ability to focus, which we've talked about before. It's your ability to focus single-mindedly on one thing at a time and to work on that one task until it's complete and to discipline yourself not to do anything else or to become distracted by emails and bells and bips and noises and things like that. It's just the ability to focus like a laser beam on a single task. Clarity. Be absolutely clear about your goals and what you need to do to achieve them. Competence. Become very good at your tasks. And number three is concentration. Concentrate single-mindedly on your most important task and stay with it until it's complete. By the way, I could speak for two days just on concentration and I have taught these principles all over the world. But that's all that you need. Start and finish your most important task. Number four is constraints. Now, constraints are a concept that was developed in Tel Aviv by a management consultant many years ago. And it says that between where you are today and where you want to be sometime in the future, a goal, there is always one constraint or choke point that determines the speed at which you get from here to here. That's the constraint. So, the art of life is to identify the constraints that are holding you back from achieving the goal that you want to achieve. And it could be something simple, like finding a parking space. It could be something simple like getting your shopping done and so on. Continually ask what the constraint or limiting factor is, what they call it, the limiting factor between here and where you want to go. So you say to yourself, all right, you want to achieve a particular goal. So you ask yourself, what is the one factor that determines the speed at which you achieve that goal? What is the one factor that determines the speed at which you achieve your most important goal? And you work with your downline, you work with your consultants, you work with other people, and you help them to be absolutely clear. Don't try to change the world. Try to change one thing, one factor. Try to alleviate the one factor, and that'll change your whole life. So I'm going to give you the other principles that we have. The number five is continuous learning and development. Dedicate yourself to becoming better and better at what you do. It must be a part of your life. You must breathe in, breathe out, and learn new things. Self-made millionaires, self-made billionaires, spend 60 to 90 minutes every day studying their field reading new material. Warren Buffett was just relegated from number three to number four richest man in the world. And Warren Buffett reads 500 pages a day. Warren Buffett reads five to eight hours a day. Warren Buffett reads eight hours, eight days a week. He reads all the time. Number six is commitment. And we know this because you talked about it a lot. His commitment is really important. There's no success without commitment. Whether it's you putting your whole heart into what you're doing and putting your whole heart into what you're doing for a long time. But if you do, there is no limit on what you can accomplish. As you get up in the morning and you make a decision that by gum, I am going to succeed in this business, no matter how long it takes, no matter how many hours a day. Number seven is courage. And courage, Winston Churchill said, the word courage is rightly considered the foremost of the virtues, for upon it all others depend. And courage. What you have is two parts. The first part of courage is the courage to begin, to launch, to take a chance, to face failure and rejection, to try something with a very great possibility that you will fail and you'll feel embarrassed and upset and your self-esteem will go down and so on. But the second part of courageous persistence, it's the power to keep going and keep pushing yourself and driving yourself.
So how do you develop this unshakable quality of persistence which will guarantee your success in life? Nothing could stop you if you don't quit. If you don't quit, then the only alternative is you must succeed and eventually you must succeed greatly. Well, I mean great rule, you become what you think about. But you become what you say to yourself. So what you do is you say to yourself these magic words. You say, I never give up. Say it. Say, I never give up. Never give up. Thoughts held in mind produce after their kind. What you think becomes your reality. Earl Nightingale in his audio program, The Strangest Secret, says that you become what you think about. Ralph Waldo Emerson summarized this idea more than a hundred years before by saying, a man becomes what he thinks about most of the time. The law of mind is extremely powerful and is in many ways a basic law for explaining many of the other laws that refer to mind action. The natural extension of the law of mind is the third law of success called the law of mental equivalent. This law says that your primary responsibility to yourself is to create a clear and accurate mental equivalent of what you wish to experience in each dimension of your external life. If you want to be happy, you need to clearly define for yourself and create the mental equivalent or picture of exactly what happiness means to you. If you wish to enjoy health and long life or happy relationships or financial prosperity, you need to create in your mind an exact, detailed picture of what you desire. As a result of a whole series of other laws that I'll be discussing, this becomes the critical starting point that begins inevitably to lead you to the realization of your dreams and goals. The fourth law of success is called the law of correspondence. This law has been talked about for perhaps 4,000 years, and it's one of the fundamental laws that explains human experience. It simply says that as within, so without. It says that your outer life will tend to be a mirror image of your inner life. Your external world will tend to correspond almost exactly to what is going on inside both your conscious and subconscious minds. There are four major areas where you see the law of correspondence working all the time. The first is simply in your attitude. Whatever your attitude is, often before you even say anything, people will reflect it back to you in the way they talk to you and treat you, as within, so without. The second area where the law of correspondence is evident is in your relationships. Your relationships will almost perfectly mirror your attitude and your personality. If you're a good and happy person, you'll have good and happy relationships. As you become a more patient and tolerant and loving person, your relationships will reflect this almost immediately, very much as a mirror will do. The third area of correspondence that you see is in your health. Much of your health can be directly traced to specific attitudes that cause you to suffer from minor and major illnesses. The extensive work that's been done in the area of holistic medicine seems to suggest that there are corresponding attitudes of mind for most illnesses that you or I suffer from, from the common cold and flu all the way up to the most serious illnesses that are often life-threatening. Whenever you're anxious or upset or unhappy for any reason, for any period of time, your body will begin to reflect those feelings. The entire basis of psychosomatic medicine is the conclusion that your mind, psycho, makes your body, soma, sick. What your mind harbors, your body eventually expresses. The fourth application of the law of correspondence is that your external world of material accomplishment will exactly correspond to your internal world of preparation. The more knowledge and skill you gain that helps you to be more effective in your work, the more you will be paid. You can't hope to acquire or achieve anything more on the outside until you've acquired it or achieved it on the inside. The law of correspondence reigns supreme. The fifth law of success is the law of belief, which says that whatever you believe with emotion becomes your reality. You always have a tendency to act in a manner consistent with your innermost beliefs and convictions. Your beliefs, in fact, act like a filter or a screen that edit out incoming information and only allows into your conscious awareness the things that you've already decided are true about yourself and the world. William James of Harvard said, belief creates the actual fact. In the Bible it says, Whatever a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. For example, if you absolutely believe that you are meant to be a great success in life, and that no matter what happens, nothing can stop you from achieving the greatness that is yours, you'll act in a manner consistent with that belief, and you'll eventually make it come true. If you doubt your ability to be successful for any reason, this negative belief will be demonstrated in your tendency to hold yourself back. The most important part of the law of belief is the necessity for you to question your own self-limiting beliefs. These are the beliefs that act like the brakes on your potential. 
These are the nagging doubts and fears that people have about themselves and their abilities that cause them to sell themselves short. When you have self-limiting beliefs, you have a tendency to settle for far less than you may be capable of. Self-limiting beliefs revolve around your ability to lose weight, or quit smoking, or earn a certain amount of money, or be attractive to members of the opposite sex, or develop new abilities that are more conducive to your success and happiness. One of the most important steps you can take toward achieving great success is for you to question these self-limiting beliefs. You might even ask others who know you well what self-limiting beliefs they seem to think that you have that may be holding you back. Remember, self-limiting beliefs are often used as excuses. A good way to test your self-limiting beliefs is to ask yourself whether anyone else with the limitations you perceive you have has nonetheless gone on to achieve success. You can also look at your own actions to decide what it is that you truly value. Remember, it's not what you say or hope or wish or intend that is a true expression of your values and beliefs. It's only what you do. Children are very aware of this, and they ignore the advice of their parents when their parents say, do as I say, not as I do. The fact is, we all seem to know that a person's actions are the true reflection of their innermost convictions. There's a great deal of confusion and unhappiness in the world today because many people feel that if they say something emphatically enough or write about it, it means that they truly believe it. But this is false. You only truly believe what you do. Your actions do speak far more loudly than your words. For example, if you truly believe in the values of persistence and dedication, it'll be evident in the things that you do every single day. If you truly believe in the values of honesty and integrity and self-discipline, you'll demonstrate these qualities in your every behavior. In fact, you can tell what a person values by looking at what they did in the past when the pressure was on. It's only when you're forced to make a choice that you know what it is you really value. For example, when you have to choose between family and work, or between money and honesty, your true values come out. The wonderful and important thing about your values is that you can develop them in yourself by disciplining yourself to act consistent with them, even if you haven't yet made them a fixed part of your character. I'll explain this later in the program. The seventh law of success is the law of motivation, which says that everything you do is triggered by inner desires and urges and instincts, many of which may be at an unconscious level, and your attitudes and behaviors will be determined by your dominant motivations. By what you really want and need in life is not by what you think you want, this is an extension of the law of values, and it's very important for you to understand. There's a simple formula called the ABC formula of human motivation and human action. The ABC stands for antecedents, behavior, and consequences. The antecedents are the things that happen before the behavior. The behaviors are the things you do. And the consequences are what happens as a result of your behavior. We know that psychologically only about 15% of your motivation comes from the antecedents, from what you read or learn, or are told to do or not do. However, about 85% of your motivation comes from your expectations, what you think will happen. It's your beliefs about the consequences, about the future, that causes you to behave in a certain way. The clearer you are about the consequences of your actions, and the more intensely you desire to enjoy the consequences that your behaviors may lead to, the more motivated you'll be. This is why it's so important to have absolute clarity with regard to your goals in each area of your life in order for you to be motivated to perform at your very best. An important point with regard to the ABC formula is that your behaviors are not guaranteed to achieve the consequences that you desire. But every behavior or action that you engage in will generate a consequence of some kind. One of the most important parts of understanding motivation and behavior is to realize that both actions and inactions have consequences. What you do, as well as what you fail to do, will have a consequence in your future. And sometimes the consequences can be dramatic and long-lasting. A good exercise in success is for you to write out a description of the type of person that you'd like to be and the kind of life that you'd like to be living. The most powerful faculty that you have is your ability to think, your ability to understand. The more accurately you can think about who you are and what you want to accomplish and how to accomplish it, the more effective and successful you will be. The eighth law of success is the law of subconscious activity, and it has several applications. The first part of this law is that whatever thought or idea mixed with emotion you hold in your conscious mind will be accepted as a command by your subconscious mind. 
This means that whatever thought, idea, or goal you can hold in your mind on a continuing basis, you can have because your subconscious mind will go to work to organize all of your thoughts and actions to bring it into your reality. If you desire to earn or attain a certain amount of money and you think about it continually day and night, and you use every means possible to drive this desire or hope deep into your subconscious mind, your subconscious mind will begin committing more and more of its reserve capacity toward bringing that goal or desire into your life. The second part of the law of subconscious activity is that your subconscious mind, once you give it the proper commands, will trigger your reticular cortex and its function, the reticular activating system. Your reticular cortex is a small finger-like part of your brain that alerts you to events and circumstances around you that are consistent with your dominant desires or concerns. For example, if you decided that you wanted to buy a red sports car, this desire would signal to your reticular cortex that red sports cars are now of paramount importance to you. From that moment on, you would see red sports cars everywhere. Even a block away, you would become extremely alert and sensitive to red sports cars, as well as to the means of attaining one of them. If one of your goals is to achieve financial independence, and you imbue this goal with intense desire, your reticular cortex will cause you to be extremely sensitive to all kinds of opportunities around you that would help you to earn more money. You would hear and see things everywhere that you might have been unaware of completely in the absence of having established this goal and planted it in your subconscious mind. The third part of the law of subconscious activity is that your subconscious mind, which controls your autonomic nervous system and all of your muscles, nerves, actions and reactions, also controls your body language and your tone of voice. Professor Moravian of the University of California at Santa Barbara has concluded that when you communicate with others, fully 55% of the message you send is contained in your body language. 38% of the message you send is contained in your tone of voice and only 7% of the message is contained in the actual words that you use. Your body language and tone of voice are largely controlled by messages about yourself and your goals that you've sent to your subconscious mind as a result of the way you think and feel. For example, when you've had a success of any kind, you send a charge of emotional energy to your subconscious mind that tells it that you're a winner. For some time afterwards, you walk and talk and act and think like a winner. Your step will be brisker, your voice will be stronger, your eyes will be more focused, and your body language will signify this belief about yourself. Your subconscious mind will accept your predominant emotional thoughts and organize your entire body, voice and tone to fit a pattern consistent with it. The ninth law of success is the law of expectations. It's often called the law of the self-fulfilling prophecy. It's one of the most powerful of all laws because of its simplicity and its predictability. This law simply says that whatever you expect with confidence will have a tendency to materialize in your life. You get not what you want, but what you expect with the greatest intensity. For this reason, an attitude of positive self-expectancy seems to go hand in hand with great success in every area of your life. The wonderful thing about the law of expectations is that you have the power to manufacture your own expectations. You can decide to expect only good things to happen to you. You can walk and talk and act as though you believe the entire world is conspiring to help you to achieve your goals. You can become what W. Clement Stone often referred to as an inverse paranoid. You can become convinced that the entire world is conspiring to do you good. The way that you apply the law of expectations is by constantly looking for the good in every person and every situation. When you have a temporary setback, you can look into the setback for the valuable lesson that it might contain. Instead of becoming upset, you can say to yourself something like, I believe in the perfect outcome of every situation in my life. This kind of affirmation causes you to approach everything you do with a more positive and open and optimistic attitude. The most powerful of all expectations are the expectations you have of yourself. You should approach everything you do with an attitude of calm, confident self-expectancy. You should expect to be successful more times than you're unsuccessful, expect to win more times than you lose, and expect to eventually achieve your goals if you carry on long enough. The tenth law of success, which applies to many other areas of life, is called the law of concentration. It says that whatever you concentrate on and think about repeatedly with emotion, tends to become more and more a part of your inner and outer life. Some of the most important work in psychology shows that if you dwell upon qualities that you wish to develop like courage and sincerity and persistence, 
You tend to actually build those qualities brick by brick into your character and personality. The law of concentration goes hand in hand with the law of subconscious activity and it largely explains the person that you are today. Whatever you've concentrated on in the past and are concentrating on in the present is having a major impact on your conduct and behavior. What you concentrate on largely determines the quality and quantity of the results that you get and the success that you enjoy. The law of success is the law of habit. It says that virtually everything that you do is automatic and unthinking. You are largely a creature of habit. It says that from the time you get up in the morning to the time you go to bed at night, you have a tendency to follow the path of least resistance and to do the things that you have become accustomed to doing in the past. You eat the same foods for breakfast. You brush your teeth with the same toothpaste. You take the same route to work. You greet people with the same words. You go to lunch at the same time. You work in the same way. Now there's nothing wrong with establishing habits that enable you to simplify your life. In fact, your life becomes successful to the degree to which many of the things you once needed to concentrate on, such as driving a car, have become automatic and unthinking. When you make certain things habitual, so they no longer require thought, your mind then becomes free to concentrate on other things that can be more helpful to you in achieving the things that you really want. There are several parts of the law of habit, and the first of these is that good habits are hard to form, but easy to live with. The second part is that bad habits are easy to form, but hard to live with. One of the hardest of all things to change are bad habits, which are counterproductive to the goals that you want to achieve. It's therefore important for you to sit down and think through the habits that you have and analyze them carefully. You need to decide whether or not they are moving you towards your goals or away from them. Remember, one of the most important of all observations on success is that everything you do either moves you in one direction or moves you in the other. Nothing is neutral. Everything counts. If a habit isn't helpful, it is hurtful. If a habit is not leading you to success, it's probably leading you to failure. The way that you overcome bad habits is simply to override them by the development of new, more positive habits. For example, if you have a golf swing that's causing your balls to go into the rough, you can override that habitual swing by taking lessons and learning how to hit the ball differently. If you have a habit of getting up later than you should, you can override that habit by repeatedly getting up earlier until that new behavior becomes the habit that dominates your thinking and your actions. By practicing the law of concentration, in conjunction with the law of habit and thinking continually about how you would be with a new habit or behavior, you drive this message into your subconscious mind and you eventually begin to behave in a manner consistent with the new habits you wish to form. This brings us to the twelfth law, one of the most important of all the laws of success, and that is the law of attraction. The law of attraction says that you are a living magnet, and that you inevitably attract into your life the people, events and circumstances that harmonize with your dominant thoughts. This is why we say that whatever you can hold in your mind on a continuing basis, you can have. Whatever thought you hold clearly and mix with emotion begins setting up a force field of mental energy that begins drawing towards you the things that you need to achieve that goal. This law of attraction has been written about for hundreds, if not thousands of years. It's contained in the old folk sayings like, like attracts like or like begets like, or you've perhaps heard birds of a feather flock together. My friend Mark Victor Hansen says that whatever you want wants you. These are all ways of saying that your mind is extremely powerful and that whatever you think, emotionalized, becomes a form of energy like a magnet that's attracting the events and circumstances you experience. In music, the law of attraction is often referred to as the law of sympathetic resonance. It explains, for example, that if you have two pianos in a large room and you hit the key of C on one of the pianos and then walk across the room to the other piano, the C note or string on the second piano will be vibrating in perfect harmony or resonance with the C string on the first piano. One of the most common examples of this law is when you enter a room full of people and you almost invariably have a sympathetic resonance or attraction with someone else in the room. You'll have a tendency to gravitate toward a person with whom you are comfortable and compatible and that person will have a tendency to gravitate towards you. Very often, two single people at a social gathering will have a level of sympathetic resonance that draws them towards each other and into conversation. By the same token, 
When you have a very clear goal or idea, you will attend to attract people to you and be attracted to people who have ideas and information and resources that can help you to realize that goal. Another illustration of the law of attraction is its opposite, which is the law of repulsion. When you begin to become a particular kind of person because of the way you change your thinking, you will find yourself attracted to people who are similar to you. And you will also find yourself repelling and being repelled by people who don't think the way you do. This law explains why positive people tend to associate with other positive people, and why negative people tend to associate with other negative people, and why neither group finds the other group of very much interest. You can begin to fill your life with the kind of people that you respect and admire, by simply becoming the kind of person in your thoughts that will attract them to you. The thirteenth law of success is the law of choice, which says that you are always free to choose the content of your conscious mind. But in so doing, you are choosing every other part of your life. Your thoughts control your reality. And since no one else but you can think for you, the thoughts that you choose to harbor determine everything that happens in your life. The wonderful thing about the law of choice is that it says that you have complete freedom to think and therefore to be anything that you intensely desire. The choice is always up to you. The law of choice also says that you are where you are and what you are because you have chosen to be there. If you're not happy with where you are and what you are, it's up to you to choose to be and do something else. The 14th law of success is the law of optimism, which simply says that a positive mental attitude goes hand in hand with success and happiness in virtually every dimension of life. The quality of optimism is the quality that makes you into a cheerful and pleasant person, a person that other people like and want to be around and help. The most successful men and women tend to be very likable people. The more optimistic you are, the happier you'll be moment to moment, and the more things you'll be willing to attempt. The fifteenth law of success, the law of change, says simply that change is inevitable. The only constant we have in life is that of change. Everything is changing, even as you listen to this tape. But the wonderful thing about the law of change is that nothing is fixed either. All progress requires change, and since change is happening in any case, you can be and have and do anything you want by simply harnessing the forces of change and taking advantage of them. The law of change also says that your life can only get better when you get better, but not until. It says that you can't remain the same and somehow improve. The law says that if you don't take advantage of change, you will end up being the victim of change. Things will happen over which you have little or no control, and you'll simply have to go along and adjust your actions and behaviors to whatever occurs. Now let me tell you a story that is true in more cases than not. Once upon a time, there was a young man from an average home with an average education, working at an average job, and who had an average group of friends. Like most average young men, he was primarily interested in girls, sports, and television. He had to have a good time, and he spent most of his money enjoying himself. He looked upon his job as a necessary evil that paid for his average lifestyle, and like most average people, he was going nowhere with his life. Then one day, something happened to him. Perhaps he read a book that woke him up, or listened to an audio program, or attended a motivational seminar. Whatever it was, he wasn't the same afterward. He realized that he could choose to do and be something else. He applied the law of choice by the law of change. He realized that his life could only improve if he began changing in a positive direction. Using the law of cause and effect, he made some decisions about what he wanted to accomplish and then began searching out the causes of the effects he desired. By the law of optimism, he was positive toward himself and his possibilities. He expected good things to happen, triggering the law of expectations. He went to work on his thinking and he began to dwell on his ideal lifestyle. By the law of subconscious activity, he began to walk and talk like the person he envisioned himself becoming. He also began noticing opportunities to advance himself that he hadn't seen before. As he changed his thinking, he triggered the law of mind and the law of mental equivalency, and he created a clear picture of his goals. By the law of correspondence, his outer world began to reflect his new, improved inner world. His beliefs about himself began to change, and by the law of attraction, People and resources began to appear to help him move toward his goal. As he concentrated on his desires, his values and motivations changed. And he began developing the kind of habits that lead to success. In no time at all, by bringing his life into alignment and harmony with the laws of success, he began moving forward at a rate that surprised even him. And so can you.
The laws of success are based on the foundation principle that in order for you to succeed, you must first decide what success means to you. You can then begin to apply these laws to your definition of success to bring it more rapidly into your reality.